Thank you so much, and I, I just so appreciate that, that extremely generous introduction. Thank you for uh, that and for both of you hosting uh, this today. And what a remarkable experience it is to look out on this room and to think back 12 years ago when the people from the YWCA came into our office when I had just become mayor and said that they wanted to have conversations about race, the single most dangerous thing you can do in the United States of America. And to think back on that, Kinshasa Kambui, who had been my staff person on that, coming back with reports on how this was going and to now look off after all of this, what a remarkable contribution it has been and how incredibly important it is that with an institution like the YWCA, with all sorts of things they can use as their tagline, saying all different sorts of things, to look up on that building, to look up on that sign over there, and to see that the words that they hold up in front of everything else is to eliminate racism. Can we thank the YWCA for decades of leadership on this remarkable work? Thank you for the great work that you do. And you see it in the talking, but you see it every day in child care centers. You see it every day in the work that they do when it matters so much. And I really want to thank Medtronic for the work that's, that's being done and supporting all of this. When I first met with Omar, when he took over as CEO, the conversation we had for about an hour was all about the diversity in this community. And I have to absolutely hold up General Mills for consistent work that I saw, not only in this, but supporting our youth violence prevention work, the Hawthorne Huddle, virtually anything that we were involved in in North Minneapolis. So yeah, I ate my Cheerios this morning, and they taste damn good, but I'm telling you, I, they mean a lot to this community. So thank you. Thank you, General Mills. It's, as I say, a real privilege to be here, and I want to talk to you a bit about the work that I'm doing today in leading Generation Next on what I consider to be uh, one of the most difficult and one of the most important challenges this community will ever have and one of the greatest assets we will ever have. And I want to talk about that, but if you'll allow me the privilege of going a bit into how I viewed race throughout my life, uh, that would be very helpful for these conversations. Because what, you, what we want you to do after I'm done yamming around a little bit here is we want you to talk to each other and really dig down to that place that is there in all of us and that we've learned so wonderfully well to cover in a community is about how you come to this work personally. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I'm a kid who was incredibly blessed to grow up in the city of Minneapolis and I grew up in a nice middle class neighborhood. It wasn't rich, it wasn't poor, it was a place where I was able to have the privilege of riding my bike around parks and go to the lake and do some wonderful things. But I also had another experience that has been absolutely pivotal in my life. And it was a privilege to have it, and it was the fact that I was, at a very young age, a witness to what was, I believe, probably the best example of common ground that we have had in this community, something that we have lost and something that we are rebuilding, but it's something that matters. And it happened to be because my parents had a drugstore at what was then 26th and 4th Avenue. Now you'll think, where's 26th and 4th Avenue? It doesn't exist anymore. 26th and 4th Avenue is about when you're driving from downtown Minneapolis down 35W and you see a bridge and then you see the Wells Fargo building. That's where 26th and 4th Avenue used to be and that's where my parents' drugstore was. It's important to me that there was my family drugstore there, but it's much more important for this community and for this discussion to understand that that part of town, while wildly imperfect, was a part of town where people came together and people were dependent on each other across racial lines. And I know that personally, and my family knew that personally, because the drugstore we had could only survive. My family's economic future was tied directly to two doctors who brought their prescriptions there, Dr. Brown and Dr. Johnson. And Dr. Brown and Dr. Johnson were the doctors who served an enormously large part of the African-American population in Minneapolis. And that was especially true as South Minneapolis began to de develop middle-class parts of town where African-Americans live. And by the way, the fact that that was news is shocking in and of itself. But as that middle class began to develop, as those doctors brought those prescriptions to my parents' drugstore, my parents' drugstore was an example of what happened throughout that corridor where 35W was. It's where people came together and needed each other. 
And when the freeway came, and when that area was torn down, and when Rondo was torn down in St. Paul, places where there was economic empowerment of an emerging African-American middle class, places where middle class white people were dependent on middle class African-Americans for their economic future, were lost. And we lost an enormous part as we ripped the heart out of the center of the city. And I saw that again on a very personal level when my parents' store moved to Chicago and Franklin. Now, as that whole thing happened, one store moving from one part of town, this town changed in another way, that that common ground split this city in half. And as the city got split in half, the places on the quote unquote other side of the freeway, Chicago and Franklin, became very, very different people. And poverty began to concentrate. And the middle class and the interdependence and the entrepreneurship was nowhere nearly as existent then. And as a little kid, I saw a huge difference. And my eyes were open to inequity as we would deliver prescriptions throughout that area. As I would look in the front door of a family where a kid was my age, I began to understand a couple things. I understood inequity on a personal level. I understood privilege on a personal level. And I understood responsibility on a personal level. And whenever anybody says, when did you get this weird idea you wanted to be mayor of Minneapolis, it was standing at a front door with a prescription for my parents' drugstore, looking in that door and recognizing the fact that I was a lucky kid who had a responsibility to be part of something more. And in my heart, I don't believe we have ever replaced the common ground that we lost that day. And while physically that cannot happen, this room is absolutely at its core what we need to do now, which is to refine that common ground. I went off to college in Boston, went to Boston College. I was lucky to get to go there. I also was fortunate to see an incredibly unfortunate thing happen because it taught me a lot. The day I landed to go to college, uh, I turned on the news and busing had begun in Boston. And this city of great neighborhoods and proud communities that were very much about people finding common ground within their own community was now a town that was being asked to share each other's children across those boundaries. And the town exploded into a level of racism I had never experienced before and thought had been buried with the civil rights issues of the South. And so every Saturday, as I would go into Boston, there would be a riot for uh, one group of African Americans supporting busing and a group of white people against it, and back and forth and back and forth. And you may remember a really wonderful picture that was about a hideous in, uh, incident in which an African American man was being attacked by a mob that was bludgeoning an American flagpole. I don't know if anybody remembers that picture, but I was a block from there when that happened that day. And I remember very much wanting to go to my first St. Patrick's Day in South Boston. And we went into there and we went into a bar thinking it was going to be a lot of fun to see a bunch of people who looked like leprechauns drinking green beer. And instead, we heard racism screamed across bars by very drunk and angry people in a level that I had never seen. And it was one of the most shocking moments I had ever had. And that whole four years in this wonderful, quote unquote, enlightened city of Boston, I saw something I never imagined would happen. And I left there very smug, saying how proud I was that that was not what was happening in my community. When I came back to Minneapolis, I continued to be very proud of my city, but I also recognized that there's a subtlety here that was very different than there. And while that never would have happened here, it might have happened in other ways. And I was a reporter for the Star Tribune, one of my first jobs, and I was assigned to cover crime. And so my job was from 3 o'clock in the afternoon till midnight to go out around the city, find out where crime was occurring, write a story about it, come back, file that story, and then go back and do it the next day. And it became very clear to me very quickly that the issue of crime, something that goes to the core of our comfort, was remarkably different across these different lines in the city. A crime would occur, a murder would occur, a shooting would occur, a robbery would occur. I would go to the scene, I would gather the information, I would come back, I would write the story, and almost immediately, I knew where it would be played in the newspaper. I would know what letters to the editor would be written. I would know what calls I would be given by answering a single question. Where was the crime? If you stop and think about that, and you ask, think about the conversations you have as the news takes place when crime occurs, and you think about how this community views 
public safety in this community, where did the crime occurs is one of the most loaded terms that we ever use because very clearly people tolerate a level of violence in communities of color far beyond what we tolerate in other places. And I would learn that lesson extremely dramatically and personally as I became mayor. But that experience as a reporter, going out and seeing that, seeing how the police reacted in those situations, seeing how my own editors, incredibly enlightened people on so many levels, how they reacted in those situations, seeing how the victims and the community members reacted in those situations taught me that we see that issue very, very differently. As I began to move toward becoming mayor, I went off from being a journalist into the private sector, did a lot of work in the, in the business and the civic community. And it became remarkably clear to me that the conversations that take place in this community among, quote unquote, where we are going in business, in the civic world, taken place in remarkably isolated conversations that it is very, very possible to lead a life that is talking about the business and political and civic future of the community in isolation in which white people see almost no people of color in those conversations. And it was a shocking realization that I bring to you not to shame this community as much as to have us simply be real about where power exists and how we share power and what we need to do moving forward. That reality, of course, changed very much when I became the person who was then supposed to lead this community. And I remember after getting elected and before taking office, having real deep heart-to-heart -heart conversations with the person who I could say absolutely anything to, which is my wife, Megan, and really wrestling with how was I, a white guy, going to step into a community that was increasingly diversifying and paint a picture of a new Minneapolis that was about all of us together. And that is one of the most complicated things I think we ever have to wrestle with. That question I asked then remains a question we ask now, but as you'll hear in a second, I feel so much better about that potential now than I used to. But in those early days, we looked at many different things that matter. And we stopped and thought, okay, what is it that really allows people to look at people who are different than them as an asset and not a deficit? And stop and think about that. Dig into your heart and ask yourself, where do we see those assets of people who are different the soonest? Well, take a very simple thing, food. Food may be the simplest, most obvious way that we do it, the most basic of needs that we have. We can go to a restaurant from another culture. We can go to an Eat Street or a Chinatown. This is where, as we really began to get the idea of the Midtown Global Market, it was about entrepreneurship, it was about ownership, but it was also about creating a highly visible place where you could go and really see the new Minneapolis in a way that was very much about saying we have a shared future. Now, food can be seen as a highly trivial part of the experience, but don't write it off, folks. The community festival, the ability to go to another place through a plate in front of you is not the most substantive place, but it's a beginning. Art is very much a part of it. One of the great heroes of this community for decades, I'm fortunate enough to be sitting at a table with, Jack Ruler with Mixed Blood, and that's the core of your work, and it's why we began to develop, be, develop the Mosaic uh, Arts Festival that was really about the idea of saying that on the stage, seeing a new community in a new Minneapolis. Those were ways to break it down, but if you really, really want to get at race, you have to get, in my sense, in my view, in that job I had, you had to get at the basic core issues that matter across lines the idea of a safe community to be in, the idea of a safe home to be in, the idea of a good job. And the wonderful thing about trying to cross boundaries on that is that those needs don't change across racial lines. They don't change across communities. We have basic needs and they are the same, but the solutions and the perceptions of those change radically and we have to have an acknowledgement of that. When you look at the issue of crime, we all want to be part of a safe community, but the issue that must be layered on top is the shocking level of incarceration, especially among African-American men in a community and all that that means. And it goes way back to the issue of suspensions in school and the remarkably disproportionate part of that. That is not an easy issue, that is not an easy issue to unpack, but it does recognize that the common goal of public safety has some very uncommon components including who polices us and how we feel we own the safety of our community.
when you take the issue of housing, you can recognize the fact that there is no one who's any different in this world about housing. We all want a safe place to live. But the issue of affordability as income inequity exists is obviously enormously important. Thank God we are in a community that finally, after generations, no longer has housing covenants, and yet there is remarkable segregation in where we live within this community. It's why fights about citing affordable housing have been so incredibly loaded and important, and it's why I'm so proud of the fact that our community, during the time I've mayor and continuing now as Mayor Hodges, has dedicated millions of dollars to affordable housing, but it's also why we need to fight the very tough battles to make sure that happens throughout the community and why we need to have a metropolitan conversation about why we are over-concentrating poverty and racial concentration within the central cities. If anybody thinks that we have solved that problem, they have not driven around this community and these communities and seeing that there are some suburbs in this community that while we were building thousands, and thousands of affordable housing units in the city of Minneapolis, those communities were putting absolutely nothing into affordable housing. We need to own the issue of where we live and understand the inequity as part of that work. When you look at the issue of jobs, you recognize the fact that we have some tremendous opportunities in this community, but we also have some special challenges. One of the most vexing is not only getting people who have long-term endemic unemployment into work, and that is a place where our city government, unlike many, invested millions of dollars over these years to get thousands of people into work. It is also about, in a private sector, one of the most complicated issues we have is retaining talented people of color who move here and then after a few years feel that it's a community that is not a place where they can find a community. It's not overt racism. It's the idea of understanding that this is a place where I can find a lot of folk who I will be comfortable with. And we have to own those facts. And the final point about both that housing and that economic justice issue is the idea of really recognizing the very simple thing we've heard for many years and we saw in, these past, in this past decade is when America gets a cold, people of color get pneumonia. And if you don't believe that, look at what happened to housing ownership in North Minneapolis. Look at what happened to jobs in this community and recognize the fact that I believe in the role of government. It is not about the idea of treating everyone equally. It is about treating everyone fairly, but recognizing you need this disproportionate investment where there is disproportionate need. And this community continues to have enormous gaps, and we do need to have disproportionate investment where there is disproportionate need. And if you take those core goals, And if you take those core goals about a safe place to, to be with your family, about a great place to live, about a good job, you also obviously at that point need to have the ability to build a great future for a next generation, and that comes to schools. And I am so proud of the work that we did during the time I was mayor, and we did some groundbreaking work. But I came in as mayor 12 years ago of the city with the largest achievement gap in the country, and I left after all of that work as the mayor of the city with the largest achievement gap in the country. And that rests really heavily on the shoulders that you see here today, and it should rest really heavily on the shoulders that I look out on today. There is no other community in the United States of America where you can look at two children walking down the street and predict their chance of success by looking at the color of their skin. There is no other community in the United States of America where you can look at two kids and predict their chance of success by looking at the color of the, their skin. Let that sink in. I know you understand that. I know you are committed to that. We need to do more. And so when I really made a decision, should I run for a fourth term and make that the core of the work that I do, or should I join an organization I've been part of and focus on that and not have the distractions that take place as mayor and do that? It was actually an easy choice. People say, was it hard not to run for mayor again? That job I loved more than almost anything I could ever name, except maybe my family and my city. But I needed to leave that job because it was clear to me that this community's enormous challenge on that 
really needed to have a full-time focus, and so that's what I'm doing. And I'm incredibly excited about that work, including the uh, board meeting we had this morning as we looked at the issue of how do we address both the in-school and the out-of-school work. So at Generation Next, we, we focused on five key goals. We're going to make sure every child is ready for kindergarten. We're going to master reading by third grade, math standards by eighth grade, high school graduation and college graduation. We're going to tie that together with some key outcomes that especially look at the uh, social and emotional health of our children and also addresses their global fluency, their ability to cross barriers and hold that up as an asset. And as much as I'd like to talk much more about that, my time is running out. But I want you to know that the work that we're doing at Generation Next is work that is complex, it is work that is uncomfortable, but it is the most important job I've ever had and the most political job I've ever had. And I, and I don't say that like a house of cards kind of politics with people backbiting and such, but this incredibly compassionate community needs to align. We don't lack a heart, we lack alignment. So many things are happening in this community that are great, but our job at Generation Next is to hold up that map find out the issues that are most, most important to move forward in a common way, and help us develop a community battle plan for that. But as we do that work, and I ask you to learn more about what we're doing on that, but as we do that work, we need to also bring something to the table that I think is incredibly important on that. And I want to bring it back to that common ground that I talked about at the beginning. Stop and think about that common ground, about the fact that my family desperately needed Dr. Brown and Dr. Johnson, and they needed us, and the patients needed each other, and together we were part of one whole that needed each other. We currently are a community where we have the lowest unemployment of any metropolitan area in the country. We are the number one volunteer community in the United States of America, and we have the largest economic and education gaps in the country. Put those together and recognize the fact that we have been able to collectively manage through this situation and have a large part of this population be successful. That time is running out. We should never have been comfortable with the situation we have been in that has left so many people behind. But now we need to not only be uncomfortable with it, but we need to recognize the fact that our ability to succeed in this world is exactly tied to fixing this problem. We literally cannot survive economically without a radical change. Because we are coming now into a population shortage. We are coming now into a workforce shortage. And the incredible gift we have of more Fortune 500s per capita than any community in America of so much tremendous success for a large part of this population, that time is over unless we are able to connect the fastest growing part of this population with the jobs that we will desperately need. 100% of the job growth that takes place in this community over the next two decades, 100% will be among communities of color. 100%. Now, there will be more white people being born, but same percentage is going to die in this community. That's the demographic story. The only place that this community finds new parts of the workforce is by matching the incredibly skilled and talented young people coming up through this population, making sure that they can move into the workforce and not writing off a generation that is out there right now that has been underskilled and undertrained and needs to be connected. We can't do it without each other. And the beautiful thing, <laughs> and the beautiful thing is that as we look at that, that whole example, the main goal, of every corporation in this community, the main goal of every organization in this community plays to the strength of a diverse community. Stop and think about that. You work at Target, you work at General Mills, you work at 3M, you work at Cargill, you work at Medtronic, and what is the question you're asking? How do I do business across cultural barriers? How do I go across the globe and sell to people in places where I'm not part of the majority culture? How do I here at home? sell to increasingly diverse populations. How do we do that? Well, we do that very simply by going into the schools of this community and opening our eyes to the incredible asset of the diversity in front of us. As our companies move into Africa 
and they try to compete with the Chinese who have a huge head start on that, we can harvest the population of African immigrants who have come into this community who know language and, and cultural skills and so many other things. And, and this is critically important, we can harvest the skills of the African-American kid in North Minneapolis or the American Indian kid in South Minneapolis who for years has gone from their neighborhood to the bus, to the school, to their summer job, crossing cultural barriers, code shifting throughout the day, and they have developed exactly the resilient strength within them that will allow them to succeed in a diverse culture. That kid may have an achievement gap, and we need to solve that achievement gap in the school. But that kid, unlike the kid who's part of a majority culture in a majority school, that kid has an achievement gap in developing the cultural diversity and the global competence that they need to succeed. And for years, when I would go into Minneapolis schools and ask kids how many spoke a language other than English, how many could see somebody different in their, that room, hands going up all over. When I asked them who knows somebody born in a foreign country, they laughed because so many of them uh, knew many, many, and all of them knew someone. The fact of the matter is, the global population, the population diversity we have is our greatest asset. And as we look at that and as we harvest that, go back to one of the issues that was taught to me that just like the great example of what your mother said was one of the worst pieces of advice I ever got. When people say we're all the same. What an incredibly well-intentioned message we were given as people who grew up in the shadow of the Civil Rights District. Try not to see people as different. Try to see us all as exactly the same. That, I believe, is a wonderfully well-intentioned piece of advice, but there's a difference between being the same and being equal. And there is an incredible importance in this community to recognize there is a difference between Wonder Bread and the fact that wheat bread with a whole lot of different flex in it is something that is much richer. If you really look at this community, and we really dig down into that, I don't believe we need to say that everyone is exactly the same. I do believe we need to find common ground. And that, I believe, is the magic of this community right now. We are dramatically different than we ever were before. That is dramatically better than we've ever done before. And to take this incredibly complex issue down to a very simple point, I want you to think about a lawn. For a generation, we've looked at the idea of the lawns in front of our house as being exactly the same. Take every blade of grass. Try so hard to get those different weeds and natural grasses out of there and have it look exactly the same and line up in the same way and get that leaf blower out and have that look totally perfect. And now we realize that's exactly the worst thing you could do to a lawn. Here, where the woods meet the prairie, where the landscape is so wonderful, we shouldn't be trying to take all those different strands of grass out of the lawn. We should try to recognize that as each flowers in its own unique way, it creates a collection that is far more beautiful and far more connected than it could ever be if we tried to treat everything the same. We are many people in one place, and the common ground requires an uncommon ability to understand exactly why different people can find a common place. Thank you.